So thank you for staying with us, even if you're hungry. I'll, I'll just make a first step back here um, about VR. Uh, I would say if you really think about what happened I mean, this last decades, I mean, first we had VR during 30, 40 years that has been used to recreate as as precisely as possible, the, the real world. It was simulator. We had a fantastic uh, contribution last year of Philippe Fuchs working in the automotive industry to see how we could train pilots and all this kind of things, really trying to mimic the real world. Then we had this access to VR to a larger audience. And that the great thing is we could invent new landscape, new experience, uh, create new worlds. Very exciting. I think now we're looking towards a new type of experience. It's how we can look at the real world using VR, but in a special way. Not trying to mimic uh, the, the, the real world, but to see it with the advantage of VR and create new vision of the real world. And I think this is how VR can really uh, go to the wider audience and be part of our life. If you think about very traditional media, like um, literature, I mean, most of the literature is describing or showing uh, the real world in a different way on specific stories. It's not only about science fiction, science fiction or creating new worlds. I think that's really what we try to do at uh, the lab where I'm, I'm working um, at too. So my lab is part of the uh, EPFL, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. And our goal is to see how we can turn technical performance into user experience. In the last panel, one of the question was but how we can get to a broader audience. I think it's interesting, yes, we have places where we have hundreds or thousands of people coming, but that's not the huge audience, it's not, not the real wide audience. And we must be careful because you have a lot of you know, company, consulting company, they say, oh yes, increasing curve, fantastic, and we'll be your consultant, we'll help you and we'll make money. Uh, great. <laughs> I think we need to be careful also because we have seen in augmented reality with some glasses, uh, very well known brand, or with a 3D TV that we can also have some, let's say, backfire, things that doesn't work, that is not adapted by a large audience. And that costs a huge uh, uh, amount to the industry. So I think we need to think how we can really bring meaning to this uh, VR stuff. So in my lab, we have designers to see how we can think about new center of use, new interaction. Uh, we have architects. We think about the real space because we're still real people living in the real world. We have also engineers, very important, because we need to do real prototypes, test how we can integrate this new technology, how we can create new types of interaction. And then we have also psychologists. Why? Because we need not just to make only cool stuff. We need to be able to show and to understand what people perceive, what they understand. Are they looking at great 3D, wow, fantastic. And after three minutes, they just looked for the vomiting bag, and it was a nice experience, a rolling coaster. Okay, but do they really look at the story? What do they understand? What is their emotional state? Can we bring something which is close to something which is disruptive and at the same time, almost normal? Super normal, we'll call, uh, call some, some of the designers. That's where we can re-bring the VR in the real life and make not only money, but bring, bring some new cultural stuff. So we're presenting the, this year, a bit like last year, but we're in the new step, Chronogram, which is a great uh, journey with a Vachon Constantin uh, a manufacturer, uh, one of the biggest manufacturers of traditional watchmaking in Geneva. We have the DH Lab Digital Humanities Laboratory at the EPFL, and for sure, the EPFL, like a lab, my, my lab. And here we try to do three major things. First, we have, it's a data-driven experience. It's not just a nice picture, it's really data, big archives. It's the history of watchmaking, 260 years of watchmaking, how we can bring this back to life. I think this is a key question. And then how we can make credible, real content in the virtual life. Because here, we are looking at real content, so we see it in the virtual world, but how we can re make it real. This kind of interaction between the real life and the virtual uh, representation is a crucial thing. And at the end, how we can induce new type of interaction between these two worlds, and so among people. We saw a lot of pictures where you have everybody together being with a, with a mask. Can we go a little bit further and track have interaction between real people using some VR stuff, 
playing perhaps with 2D and 3D stuff. That's something that you can experience here at the booth uh, number four uh, with the, the, the chronogram. So 260 years of watchmaking, a lot of, of uh, documents, paper documents, registry. What, what can we show with this? And you will see that's not only the document that you want to show, but we can here have a global vision of this heritage. And here we had the chance to work with the DH lab to see how we can digitize all this material, because for sure when you have old letters, uh, it's very complex. And, and the, big f the first big challenge is how we move from you know, just scans of, of these documents towards some real informational system where you can be able to recognize the words, recognize items, make a link between the documents, and create really a whole story of this. But then it's just available for archivists. And what is interesting is to bring this to a wider audience and to show what is really the essence of this global information system. And so it's what we're doing in this project and um, with this archives. And here I will let now the floor to uh, Marius uh, Eberly. He's our uh, interaction, uh, one of our interaction designer. And he's also the um, project manager of this, uh, of this uh, chronogram project. So Marius will let you know a bit more about the design thing. Thank you, Nicola. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Nicola, for this introduction. Uh, I will be brief because we are all hungry and very late. Um, the big uh, design challenge of this project was really to create a very special link between the users and the content. Okay. And to make him feel exactly the same kind of feelings you have when it's the first time you discover the real archives. The first time you visit the archives, there are three key feelings. The first one is Wow, that's crazy. There are so many documents. The second one is, oh shit, that's almost impossible to retrieve a specific information in that. And the third one, it's when you read your first document from the archives, it's, wow, it's not so interesting, actually. That's a very old bill, that's all. But it was okay. It was really the starting point of the project, and the ambition was to make the user feel the same kind of feelings than that. But not only. As Nicola said, we were working with the DH Lab, and it was about also creating a data uh, visualization system, a big uh, system of information which has to be sustainable and completely dynamic. But the problem with the process is just that it will take actually years and years to numerize and digitalize everything. So at this moment, we were working, and we're still working, with less than 1% of the total amount of archives. And it means that in terms of data, it's even less. And the problem with that sample is, is not globally representative of everything. So it means that actually it doesn't mean nothing, because at the end of the project, we'll have millions of data lines like that, but we are not sure about what will be the most relevant or the most interesting criteria. Today, who is able to say which kind of criteria or indexed will be relevant or interesting in the future. Actually, it's not possible for me, and I think that for all the people involved in the project, it was not possible to. But the idea was to make data visualization, and the problem with data visualization is just that if you are not able to make storytelling from that, that's really hard to make it work with the people. But anyway, we said, enough talk, we have to do something, we have to create a prototype, let's try with what we have. So we took all the documents that we already had, so it's just uh, uh, digitized documents, and we just spread absolutely everything in a 3D space. And you know what? It didn't really work, because the relationship you had with the content was really strange. It was like a little bit stamps or that kind of things. And for us, it was a little bit disappointing, and even, as you can see here, when you put data on that, it means nothing. But the idea of the project was not really to rebuild the reality and to make uh, very advanced renders with a delicate old paper folded and floating in the space. The idea was to create a new VR typology of objects. So we said, OK, we have to make more tests. And we played with the sizes, we played with the colors, the position of the document, the behaviors, the tints, and all the different options you can have in that kind of universe. And at the end, after a couple of uh, weeks, I think we succeed to do something. It, mean, it, it wasn't like in the reality, 
But the idea was, okay, we have something which turns the value of the document from the physical world to the virtual world. But as you can see, yeah, it's not really an experience here. That's just something which is okay. And it was really far away from our expectations. It was two years ago when we began to work on that project. And we were really, really excited about how many possibilities you have uh, in terms of design in virtual reality. We were thinking, hey, we could, put, uh, we could add uh, augmented reality on virtual reality. And we have to be sure that the user is completely free to go wherever he wants and to discover a lot of things. But actually, we made a lot of tests like those ones, a lot of prototypes, but it didn't work at all too. Because we learned two things. The first one is in our case, with our, our very small 1% of documents, the less documents and contents you have, and the more you need a visual structure. It's not only to use algorithm to load the documents in a specific order, it's also to, to show it and to make it obvious for the users. In the virtual reality, je montre plus, okay. In the virtual reality, you have a lot of interaction possibilities and a lot of freedom. But actually, you don't have to forget the core value uh, interaction of your experience. In our case, it was to give the ability to the user to discover a maximum of contents in the best reading uh, conditions. And here, that's not the case in this prototype. In the real life, when you go to an archive storage room like the, this one in Vacheron Constantin, when you pick a document and you want to read it, you don't read it in the same room. You go outside to a specific desk, and you read it in, good, in a good and comfortable context for that. Here, it wasn't the case at all. So that's why we've decided to foster the, uh, this link between the user and the content, to preserve different contexts for that. We created, we created two different contexts when you are using our experience. The first one is to browse, and the second one is to read. And you are in a kind of bubble, and you have some dedicated uh, tools for that, and that's a lot better for the experience. Now, I think that that's only examples of all the work and tests we made during the two last years. But I think that design is very important for VR for different reasons. And it's not only to create high-quality user experience or new kind of brand messages or new marketing experience. The idea is that the design is really important in its, ab in its ability to question the boundaries and the requirements of a new technology. It's important to find new bridges between, uh, between different fields, like UI design and architecture, and create new set of roles, a new kind of consistency, and at the end to test a very wide panel of different uh, possibilities, and to keep the best one, not in terms of performance like a machine, but the one that ensures the use of uh, the sustainable use of technology by the people in the future. So now my colleague Yuki, who is an innovation designer, worked on a different uh, approach which enabled a new kind of interaction in the experience. Thank you. So how might we make people standing around part of the VR experience as well? This is one of the first uh, briefs that I was tasked at, as, a as a research assistant in the mass program at the EPFL lab. Uh, there, my role was to explore new technology and questioning where it might, uh, what kind of experiences we can create with them. Um, so we came to this question after several uh, observations that we made from our initial uh, VR tests. We noticed that visitors who came to the VR um, experience wanted to engage with those friends or colleagues that were already inside of the experience. Uh, this was the same with staff who wanted to help uh, with, uh, with the users. Um, and so we think, um, and so from this we wanted to try to understand how we could solve this, co this problem um, by understanding their needs and desires. Uh, we asked several questions to come up with different functionalities that w might be interesting for the final product. And so through several questionings, we came to the conclusion of, of these three functionalities of enabling users to, to follow the user, the VR user within a map so that you're able to see an overview of the whole archive, but also see the details of the documents that they were looking at. Uh, we wanted them to also browse the archive so that they could see and understand what the archives contained, the different documents that there were. But we felt that that would not be 
uh, that would create a separate experience. Uh, and so we wanted uh, to come back to this share sharing so that we could have a conversation about uh, the content itself and not just to engage and browse on their own. Um, so for the design, we didn't want it to feel like a digital uh, standard data visualization. Um, so we came to this sort of interface where people, well, the visitors can zoom in and understand what different uh, contents there are. We wanted the experience to be tactile and intuitive so that it felt like an object that they're interacting with, uh, something special like a watch that they decompose and understand how each piece has come together. We also wanted to keep in mind the scalability so that when new documents were integrated, that the aesthetics were preserved uh, and the contents were structured in a similar way. And so each line is, represents a document, uh, and we have different functionalities to help uh, visitors navigate through the archives. Um, Just a couple to finish off, yeah, I think Marius will close and wrap up the, uh, the, the talk. Go back uh, with my mic, please. <laughs> Thank you. OK, just uh, a few words about the, the next of the project of Yuki. Uh, we made some first tests, and we noticed something which was really interesting. And when I was uh, talking just before about consistency, it's exactly that. It's just that VR experience is not only uh, when you put uh, the, the, the technology on your head. That's a complete experience, uh, which is around also the scenography and the way that we welcome people and they make interact uh, with, the, with the VR users. So after the research work of Yuki, uh, we worked also a lot uh, to include the experience he developed in the, experience, the, in the existing experience. So it was around uh, creating visual that are co consistent with the VR application, but not just um, a declination, but something which is really a translation, and also uh, including screens directly into the scenography. At first, we were thinking that we could just use floating iPad, and it was possible to, to act like this. But actually, it has to be directly involved in the scenography itself to make it work with the people around. So uh, that's the experience you can try uh, just here in the room number four. Thank you. <laughs>